Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for our first educational webinar. Um, my name is Tiana. I'm the Public Information Officer for the CCB. And we're so glad that you all signed up. I see a lot of familiar names on here. This is a full session today. It'll last approximately 30 minutes. And as people continue to join, just some quick housekeeping notes. As you can see, we are recording this. It's also being live streamed on our YouTube page and it'll live there as well. If anyone joins late or if you wanna review it um, after today. We did receive several questions beforehand. So I just wanna thank all of you who sent in your questions when you signed up. If you do have a question during this webinar, feel free to submit it through the Q&A button. That should be right at the bottom of your screen. And we do have someone who's monitoring that. And so we'll keep an eye on it. And we'll try to get some of those questions um, after the presentation answered, if not during. Um, so today's webinar will be on two topics, imminent health hazards in cannabis facilities and regulations for stamping and molding edibles. Um, I have the time is 12.04 right now, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, CCB Health Program Manager Kara Cronkite, who leads our audit and inspections divisions, uh, will be presenting, and I see she's online and ready to go. So whenever um, she's ready, I'll turn it right over to her. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kara Cronkite. I'm pretty sure I know most of you that are participating today, um, so it's good to see you virtually. Um, first, I'm going to start with imminent health hazards, and I apologize, this is happening during lunchtime. Some of the images might make you lose your appetite. Um, but I'm going to start with imminent health hazards, and these are things that are, sorry, can you guys see that? Okay. And these are things that have a potential to impact public health in a negative way. They're likely to cause illness or injury. So I'm going to go through a few of the more common examples of imminent health hazards. Um, power outages are very common. If you don't have power, you're unlikely to have heat or air conditioning, adequate lighting, functioning refrigeration. This can be a big problem for um, production or retail stores who have a lot of ingredients or food items that require refrigeration for safety. Um, additionally, you would lose metric access or security camera coverage. If the power goes out for more than 20 minutes, you need to notify the CCB. Or if you lose any surveillance video at all, we need to be notified. But if it just kicks off and then kicks back on, that's okay. We don't need to be notified of those types of situations. Lack of potable water or hot or cold running water can also be pro problematic. If there's no hot water, you won't be able to properly or comfortably wash your hands, wash utensils or clean contact surfaces. Many detergents that are used in three compartment sinks or wear washing units don't actually activate. The soap won't actually activate until it reaches at least 110 degrees. And some units require hot water for sanitation as well. Um, if there's only one hand sink, for example, that does not have hot water, but you still have access to hand washing sinks in that same area and you can conveniently and safely continue to wash your hands, then you could just mark that one hand sink out of service and continue to work while it's being repaired. Uh, but if this hand sink is located in the only restroom or it's the only hand sink located outside of the restroom, then this would require self-closure and reporting to the CCB. There are also gross unsanitary occurrences or conditions. Um, by gross, I don't necessarily mean filthy. I mean excessive, um, which can also sometimes be filthy, as you see in this picture here. Um, so here we see that the sewage is backing up from a floor sink. Typically, this happens when either the flow out of a drain pipe is too fast or the floor sink itself is clogged and the waste backs up onto the floor. Um, just a side note, this picture was, and a lot of the pictures I'm using today were not taken at cannabis establishments, but they were taken at um, local restaurants. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> um, if this is happening at your only hand sink or your only three compartment sink where you wash your utensils, then you need to self-close um, and report it to the CCB. If you have other sinks that serve the same purpose, you could mark this one out of service while the issue is being repaired, as long as you're still fully compliant with our regulations. And if you're ever unsure if you would need to self-close or if you could just mark something out of service instead, you can always reach out to us. 
Um, pest infestations also fall under this category. Here you can see multi-generational roaches inside of the gasket of a reaching cooler. So this is the rubber seal around a door for a cooler storing food items. Um, since they're different sizes and different ages, you know that they're breeding inside the facility. So um, you, see, you see the extra large roach on the left and then right next to it, that little tiny spot, that's a baby roach. Um, and so if they are breeding in your facility, you need to self-close and notify the CCB. If you see them on contact surfaces, like a, a prep table, for example, this would also be considered an imminent health hazard or if they're inside of your cannabis products. If you do self-close and notify us, we'd be happy to work with you on how to properly remediate the issue. Um, here, this is an oriental cockroach, or no, sorry, this is a German cockroach. They're typical um, for breeding inside of facilities. But if you see an oriental cockroach, those are typically referred to as water bugs. They're the really big black ones. Um, they typically don't breed inside of your facilities. They just come in, check it out and leave. They might look for water or something and go. But pictured here are the German roaches. If you see one, you have a problem. Um, they are actually nocturnal. So if you see any activity of these German roaches during the day, this means that their sleeping space is completely full and that they're taking sleep shifts. So, um, so the roach will leave the wall or wherever area they're, they're supposed to be sleeping in and they'll get the day shift that day. And so you have a major problem if you see them during the day. Um, roaches like warm, moist, and dark areas. So be sure to check electrical panels, um, look around your wear washing units, inside your sinks, inside floor drains and floor sinks as well. Um, the most important thing to know about pest control um, and preventative measures is preventing access. So make sure that there's no light coming through the base of your doors. Um, if you can see light coming in, pests can come in. Um, you don't wanna see any gaps, holes in walls, anything like that where they would have access into your facilities. Second, don't give them any reason to stay. So if they do get in, they shouldn't want to stay in your facility. Um, limit the harborage conditions, so food, water for them. This would be things like pooling water, um, dirty floor drains, things like that. that. That's considered a harborage condition. And then um, use of a pest control operator is really your last line of defense. Rodents, um, such as rats, are also problematic in facilities. It's unlikely that you'll actually see one, um, but you might see signs of them instead, such as the matted, matted bedding that you see in this photo or their droppings um, you can also see in this photo. So if you see these types of signs, you need to address the issue immediately. Um, I recommend working with your pest control operator if you do see such signs. Excessive buildup um, on a floor, for example, is not really likely to make anyone sick, but it can lead to pest infestations and other contamination risks that um, could be considered dangerous. Um, especially if the excessive buildup is on contact surfaces where your cannabis and cannabis products are touching the surface directly. Um, and also even on your floor, if you have excessive foot traffic in the area and you have fans blowing, um, you're very likely to spread any contamination onto your cannabis as well. If you don't have adequate space to store items that require refrigeration, this is also an imminent health hazard. Um, if your cooler is overstocked, for example, so the image on the left, um, there's no room for airflow. So you can see on the right, this is a good example of how the air flows within a refrigeration unit. Um, also, if your cooler goes down, or say one, say you have three and, and only one is functional, you don't have space to store everything. Or if all of them go down, um, then this could be potentially hazardous. So any food items that have the potential to grow pathogens are considered potentially hazardous items. They must be um, temperature controlled for safety. So if these do go down for more than 20 minutes, you need to notify the CCB. And we can work with you. If you notify us fast enough, we can work with you on potential so solutions to salvage your refrigerated items. And um, lack of adequate facilities for employees. If your staff don't have a place to use the restroom or to wash their hands, then you can't operate. Um, this may occur due to plumbing issues or remodeling. Either way, whatever the circumstance is, you have to cease operation and notify the Cannabis Compliance Board. 
Also, if you become aware that a poisonous or toxic material was misused in your facility, you have to immediately notify us and, and quarantine the product if you're aware that it touched any product. So this, some examples could be accidental use of a chemical instead of like a food grade oil that you were trying to use. Um, this is why labeling your chemicals and your spray bottles is so important. Um, also, if there's accidental use of an illegal pesticide that somebody brought in or any other similar situation, just notify the CCD. If you have a suspected outbreak of foodborne illness or any other type of negative reaction in your facility. Um, so if you receive a notice that your product may have made someone ill, you need to notify us immediately. Um, in this picture here, these are the five major symptoms of foodborne illness. Um, your staff cannot work if they've experienced any of these in the past 48 hours. So jaundice, when their skin gets really yellow, um, if they have an exposed infected wound on their hand or arm that they cannot properly cover, um, if they have diarrhea, vomiting, or if they have a combination of a sore throat and um, fever. So the two of those combined is considered one item. Um, if you receive reports that your products made someone vomit, have diarrhea or other um, negative re reactions, um, you can send us an incident report to the CCD. And um, if, if it seems like there may be some foodborne illness link, I recommend um, reaching out to us immediately and, and shutting down your operation, self-closing. Um, I got this image from the Southern Nevada Health District's website. If you want information on general food safety pra practices, um, their food establishment resource library is a great place to obtain informational posters that you can just print and post throughout your facility. It's a really good resource. So if you just type in SNHD and FERL, it should pop up for you. If you have a fire in your facility or it becomes flooded, you must cease operations and notify us immediately. For fires, smoke can be a contaminant in itself, but also the water from the sprinklers is unsanitary and that can be a source of contamination. Um, also water from floods is not potable water, so it has to be considered contaminated. Um, the later effects of water damage are also something to consider for potential sources of mold that could contaminate your product. And then this one, um, governor's emergency directives. We all experienced this one recently with COVID. Um, I never really thought I would experience this, but um, here we are. And this is why we're virtual today. <laughs> so if there's an emergency directive to close or take additional measures, then you are required to comply with that. And additionally, if the board determines that there is a condition or circumstance that endangers public health, this can also result in an immediate cease of operations. If you're unsure if you have such a condition in your facility, please email us. Um, I put the email on this slide and it's also on the final slide too, but it's auditinspections at ccb.nv.gov or submit an incident report to us um, as well. If you fail to cease operation during an imminent health hazard and you don't contact us, this falls under a category two violation. It could result in up to a $25,000 fine and 20 day suspension. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little to something a little more appetizing, hopefully for, for lunchtime, bring your appetite back a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna talk about stamping and molding edible cannabis products. We're frequently asked why every state has a different symbol. The reason is that it helps us to know which state products were made in. So since cannabis is still federally illegal, crossing state lines is legal. With this um, symbol, we can tell if our Nevada products leave the state or if products are coming into Nevada from another state. Regulation 12.020 requires that this symbol be stamped or molded into each serving of an edible product. So if you have a hard candy like the image on the right, each hard candy would have to be marked with the state symbol. It looks like a yield sign with THC and an exclamation point. If you have a chocolate bar or some other product with multiple servings, each serving must be marked with the symbol and they must be demarked and easily separable so that it's obvious to the consumer what a serving is. So you can see in the chocolate bar, um, they can easily be broken apart. And on the left, I like the image on the left because that's edible ink that's printed onto paper and so that can just be um, put straight onto food items and, and consumed that way. 
The regulations um, for NCCR 12.015 subsection seven were actually just workshopped to clarify this language. So if you attended the workshop, you may be familiar with this. Um, this is regarding individual wrapping or marking with the dose. So this is different than the requirement to mark with the symbol that we saw in 12.020. This is a different regulation and a different requirement completely. So you have two options with this requirement. The first option is the most common in the industry. We'll just include the, the dose in milligrams physically demarked onto the serving. So you can see um, several examples here of edible ink, molds, or even more creative options. Since many facilities are already marking the product with the universal symbol, it's easy for companies to just add the dose in milligrams right there on the product. Um, and then if a production facility doesn't wanna do that or if it's difficult to do so, they have another option. Your other option um, could be to individually wrap each serving. There are several ways that a facility could accomplish this and the CCB does not have a preference. Whatever works best for your operation is fine with us. If you're not sure if it's going to be compliant the way that you're individually wrapping, you can always um, shoot over an email and, and ask if that's something that we would find acceptable. Uh, but whether they're candy wrappers twisted on the ends, squeeze packets, um, tear like a mint wrapper, those are all um, great examples. If you have products which cannot be stamped or molded with the universal symbol, um, such as powdered, uh, powders, dried fruit, or popcorn, you can request an exemption to mark your product um, with the universal symbol. So if you go into a Stella, the request code is RSM for reviewing stamp or mold. If you feel that your item qualifies to be exempt, um, you can submit that review, um, submit that request to review in a Stella. Um, be sure to include a picture of your product because if you tell me it's a gummy and it can't be marked or molded. I've seen several gummies marked or molded, so I'm going to have a lot of follow-up questions for you. Um, and if it, if it is determined that it cannot be marked with the symbol, then each serving has to be individually wrapped, and that symbol has to appear on that wrapper for each serving. So if the entire package is one serving, then the symbol can just appear on the package. So um, on the left, since each serving is individually wrapped. The dose doesn't have to be marked on it because those are your two options, right? Individually wrap or mark with the dose, but that THC warning symbol does have to appear on the individual wrapper. Um, same with the popcorn pictures on the right. And then in the middle, um, this would be an example of if a whole package is one serving. So say there's only 10 milligrams of THC in that whole package, they could just put the warning symbol on the outside of that package. So I received a question that says, so you're saying that if we have a chocolate bar with the state symbol molded into it, we also need to have 10 milligrams molded into it. And that is correct. Or whatever your dose is, if your dose per serving is five milligrams, you would mark five milligrams just right there under the, the symbol that you have. Or if you have another way to do it, if you want to put the edible ink on the backside, um, whatever works for your operation, that's correct. Okay. And then liquids that have more than one serving per container have to be sold with a resealable, reclosable cap. Um, additionally, they must either demark each serving on the side of the container. So you'd have like a, a clear line with the servings demarked on the side as they drink down the beverage. Um, or they have to provide an accurate measuring device. So you can see in the picture above, uh, or in the picture here in the middle, there's to, there's a measuring spoon and a measuring cup. So each one show, you know, milliliters or tablespoons or, you know, some sort of very accurate measuring device. Um, tinctures are, we get this question a lot, are tinctures edibles? Um, it depends on the intended use. So tinctures typically aren't edibles because they're designed to be absorbed sublingually. Um, they're not ingested and passed through the stomach. So if your tincture is intended to be swallowed orally, then it would be considered an edible, but usually they're not. Okay, and that was all that I had for you today. Um, so I'm not seeing 
the additional questions at this time. So I will go ahead and turn it back over to Tiana. Okay, Kara, thank you for presenting all of that. Um, if you guys do have any follow-up questions, you saw on the last slide, um, she did have the audit inspections email, and that would be for uh, specifically for questions regarding what she talked about. Um, Kara, it does look like we have one more question um, in the, the Q&A, if you want to take a quick look. Looks like Jason is typing up an answer right now. Okay. Um, so while he's doing that, I just want to thank you all for joining us. We hope you found today informative. And of course, as we continue to grow this series, if you have a topic that you'd like us to cover next or in the future, um, you can send an email to us with your suggestions. Um, that email is going to be ccb-media, M-E-D-I-A, at ccb.nv.gov. And again, just a reminder that this um, we're streaming live on YouTube and we'll also live on our YouTube page so you can go back and revisit it if you missed any um, of the questions or any of the emails that you needed. I'm just taking a look at our Q&A. Some of these. Sarah, can you mention again which subsections of the regulations contain the requirements for the servings? Yes, so I referenced two different sections. Um, regulation 12.015, subsection 7, is the one that goes over um, individually wrapping or marking with the dose. That was just workshop, so you will see some clarifying changes to that coming out very soon. It just makes what I explained today more clear. Um, and then the other one about marking with the symbol is 12.020. Okay, perfect. Um, so Adam, you asked a question, will each week be different information. We are not necessarily going to be doing this weekly, but each session will in fact be a different topic. Um, so that's why it's helpful if there's something that your group, your establishment, um, your the employees you work with want to know something and, and it's a big topic that you think you'll have a lot of questions about, um, just email us your suggestions. Again, that's ccb-media at ccb.nv.gov. And with that, it looks like we answered all of the questions. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day. We hope you'll join us for future webinars.